King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, art everywhere present and fill us all things, treasury of good things and giver of life. Come and dwell within us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Hey everybody, welcome back to Reason and Theology. You get a second show for the day. We're talking about um, the case of Nestorius in the fourth, uh, I'm sorry, fifth century. And we're also asking, does it give us precedent for judging Pope Francis and whether or not he holds the office of the papacy? Um, this has come up many times, but it's something that just recently came up from Dr. Edmund Maza, who used seemingly this argument uh, to defend the thesis that he is able to question whether or not Pope Francis is the Pope today upon these grounds. At least that's the impression I get. I'm going to show the video uh, just so that we can make sure to not take him out of context. And I want to discuss it, whether or not what he said is historically accurate um, and whether or not it gives us precedent for making such determinations about Pope Francis, or at least asking su such questions about Pope Francis and doubting um, whether or not he holds the papacy. I did find it curious, um, because this is usually an argument that set of a contest used to say that all of the popes in the post-conciliar era are not the popes. So I, I did find it interesting, because I kind of think if... Um, if Dr. Mazza takes what he says and applies it to the other post-conciliar popes as the set of a contest that he got this argument from, if he consistently did that, I wonder if he would also question whether or not John the 23rd was Pope, Paul the sixth was Pope, John Paul the second. I mean, we could also say John Paul the first, uh, and Benedict the sixteenth, um, which doesn't seem to be his view because I believe he believes that Benedict the sixteenth is still the Pope. But I guess my question would be, upon what grounds would one say such things when I think the set of a contest rightly take that argument and apply it to the other preconciliar popes. Now, I don't agree with this set of a contest argument that Dr. Maza is going to express here because I don't think it's historically accurate. Um, it's also against Constantinople IV and Canon X, so it's against our canonical tradition. Um, but I'm going to establish that on historical grounds, which is where he took it because he says he's a historian, which is true. I'm, I'm not saying he's not. He says he's an historian, and he goes on to give us an historical um, precedent for his thesis. But on grounds of history, I think that his position is not sustained, and I don't think it was entirely accurate the way he portrayed the history. We're going to do that by actually going through uh, Father Richard Price and the documents and proceedings on the Council of Ephesus 431. Uh, and I've had Price on the show multiple times. Um, perhaps I can have him back on to discuss this specifically, but for now I'll use the primary sources. Well, I mean, somebody might say this is secondary since it's translated, but primary in the sense that we're going directly to what Pope Celestine has said, what the council has said, um, what Cyril has said, and then we're going to look also at Constantinople IV, which has bearings on this question. So um, in that sense, we're going to the primary sources. Okay. Um, let me share my screen just so that I can get um, Dr. Maza in context and I, I can make sure that I'm not taking him out of context because I want to be charitable to him. Um, this is not meant as an attack on Dr. Maza. Um, I think a lot of people have... Um, they aren't aware of the difference between challenging a person's views in attacking the person. And there's certainly a difference. I'm not attacking Dr. Maz. I'm sure he's a really nice guy. And I'm sure I would get along with him, you know, as, as far as persons. But as far as his perspective, I'm, I'm going to critique that. But please don't mistake that to mean that um, I'm, I'm attacking him or something as, as a person. That's certainly not the case. I think we need to be charitable um, in our interactions and uh, comments on others. So I'll, I'll do my, you know, do my best to carry that standard here. So, but again, please don't misunderstand my criticisms of his position and confuse that with criticisms of the person 
or judgment on his motives or things like that. I assume that he has good motives and intentions and is not trying to misrepresent the history. I think at the end of the day, he does misrepresent the history, but I don't believe that's his intentions. I don't have any, any reason to believe such things. Okay. Um, let's pull up the video again so I can make sure to get them in context. This was um, just done a, a few days ago, or was it? Is it yesterday? It was yesterday. Um, and I was in the chat and I also offered a few comments, but there's there's only a whole there's only so much you can do with 200 character limit at a time. You know, the, some of these questions aren't ones that you could really settle in um, a comment section. I think they were also talking about a more satitia. I would be happy to do more um, commentary on that in the future and engage some of their concerns. I do think that their concerns have been addressed sufficiently, but I'd be more than happy to do that. But that will have to be another show. I mean, frankly, um, it's it's really easy to present these challenges. It's a lot harder to explain why a lot of them are unfounded. Um, it's kind of like it's really easy to de destroy and wreck a room. It's a lot harder to clean it up. I mean, I could knock off all the books on my, my, my shelf behind me in probably less than one minute. Um, but it would take me several hours probably to fix them all. And so it's really easy to throw out criticisms. And there's a lot of them here that they, they raise. And I think they're legitimate questions that they're asking. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is some things can't be answered, you know, in 200 characters. They, they require further engagement. And so perhaps I could do that in a, another video. Uh, for this one, however, I wanted to uh, latch on to some of the comments that were made right at the end about the case of Nestoria. So let's watch this. Let, let's see what uh, Timothy Gordon asks Dr. Mazza, and let's see what he says. But you, are you, how certain are you? How certain do you claim to be? <laughs> By the way, tell me if y'all can hear that. Before I continue and play the entire clip, and I'm going to play the entire clip and then offer my commentary. Um, before I play the entire clip, Tell me that y'all can hear that in the chat because I don't want to do a whole nother episode where I play something and y'all can't hear it and I offer commentary on, you know, <laughs> silence. <laughs> so we're not we're not doing that one again. Please post. OK, y'all can hear it. OK, let's let's proceed. That you know that Benedict is Pope. I just you're like just you're like asking me do it like Dr. Mazza, you still beat your wife. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not. I know you, Dr. Mazza does not be, but, but I mean, how certain can you claim? How much certainty can you claim? I say that you should join me in telling the Pope splainers out there, as I've been saying for all nine years of his pontificate, two weeks in. This is too weird, man. And it's the case has only grown. You can't say nothing to see here. You also can't claim you're sure of much of anything. And, and I promised I was going to play the whole clip before I interact with it. I, let me give a caveat. That's where Dr. Maz's comments. Let me also just say that I agree with Timothy Gordon that we cannot just dismiss some of the questions that are being asked today. I think we need to engage them. Uh, so anybody who's just dismissing these things, I don't think that that's doing the situation justice. There are legitimate concerns that people have and legitimate questions that people have. Um, However, I do think that there are also answers that do not lead us to the conclusion of Dr. Maza. And I'm not saying that Gordon thinks so. I'm just saying that I think that there are answers that we should be giving to these questions. Um, uh, however, without adopting the idea that Pope Francis is not the Pope and Benedict XVI is the Pope, which I've dealt with in other videos. So watch my playlist, like Magisterium playlist, Papacy playlist, stuff like that. Um, you can look my name up and type in Benevacantism, and I talk about it there. Uh, so so I, I agree that these are legitimate questions. You just can't hand wave them, play a Jedi mind trick, and pretend like there's nothing there. We do need to address them. There are legitimate concerns here. Founding Francis. Well, I'll say this. Uh, I'll give an example from history because I do have a PhD in history. Uh, All right, so he's appealing to history. Let's hear it, Dr. Mazza. Uh, so back around the year 430, in the imperial capital of Constantinople, uh, the new bishop there, Nestorius, gave a sermon in, in which he basically, a Christmas sermon of all things, in which he denied that Mary was the Theotokos, the God-bearer, the mother of, of God. And it was a layman who stood up in the cathedral and said, that's heresy. You're a freaking heretic. <laughs> that's my pa paraphrase. Um, and then that layman, um, didn't stop there. He put up placards in the cathedral and around the city of Constantinople 
calling on the bishops and, and the monks and the people to join him in taking a vow against this heretic. And then he explained how Nestorius was essentially channeling Paul of Samosota. Have you ever heard of him? He was like a heretic from the second century or third century um, in the 200s, I guess. Anyway, long story short, um, I believe if I remember his name right, this guy was Eusebius of Doraleum. And was he, you know, did, did, did people run him out of town because it was not his place to, to call it like he saw it? No, he was later confirmed by, by the Pope and, and people like him were confirmed by the Pope. And the Pope said that when Nestorius tried to excommunicate you for saying these things, that excommunication was invalid because he had lost his office for being a heretic. So what I would say is I think Eusebius was right for standing up, but it's also true that we didn't get finality until the Holy See, the Pope, uh, actually came out and said, yeah, Nestorius was a heretic. And of course, in 431, they held the Council of, uh, of Ephesus mm -hmm. and, and formally defined Nestorianism as a heresy. Yeah, that's, that's, that's helpful. Okay. Um, let me maybe bring it back just in case I need to reference a specific part again. But uh, let me stop sharing my screen for a moment. Okay, let's let's let me offer some interaction with that. Sounds convincing at first, um, and I imagine that there's a lot of people who aren't familiar with the history behind this. And my concern is for people who aren't familiar with the history of of this issue, which I think is probably the majority of people watching the video. It's going to sound convincing. Um, there's scripture that talks about one man's testimony sounds convincing until another man comes and cross examines him. You know, it's from the book of Proverbs. That's certainly applicable here. There's a lot of stuff that I've heard from Dr. Mazza that it sounds convincing until you you actually look further into it, and then maybe not so much. And so that's what I hope to do here is show that I don't think it's as clear cut as he indicates, um, nor does it give precedence for him. So again, uh, it sounds like the thesis is that the this particular case with Eusebius and Nestorius gives precedent for us saying that Pope Francis um, is not the Pope or has lost his office. Um, um, uh, again, I hope I haven't misrepresented Dr. Maz. I really hope I haven't. I, that's the way I've understood what Dr. Maz is saying here. If I've misunderstood him, well, you know what? I, I apologize. Let me at least engage those who think that that does give precedence for it because I have seen this many times with set of a contest. So at the very least, if I'm not understanding Dr. Mazza correctly, this would at least be a response to set of a contest who use this argument um, to promote their thesis, which again, I did find interesting because Dr. Mazza is not um, technically a set of contest. He's a bent of a contest, which is, I suppose, a form of set of a contest, uh, just depending on how we define set of a contest. Um, and it, it, very strictly speaking, he, he, he's not a set of a contest because he doesn't believe that the sea is vacant. He does believe that Pope Francis holds the sea, if I recall correctly. So very technically, he's not a set of a contest. Um, however, if, if, if you're saying that so-and-so is Pope when they're not, and the Pope who actually is Pope isn't, there, there's a loose sense in which that's set of a contest. But it's not exactly the same. That's why I call it bin of a contest. It's a little, little different. Because um, he does think that the sea is occupied, he just thinks it's occupied by the person that a person that it's not actually occupied by. Um, but again, I found it interesting because he's appealing to a set of contest argument that is used to say that all of the post-conciliar popes are not the popes. And I would just be curious to see how he would respond to a set of contest who uses this exact argument to say that John Paul II, for example, is not the pope because of a CC nineteen eighty six. Um, would Dr. Maza agree with him that he's not the Pope because of that? Or Benedict, who I believe in 2002 had his own version of Assisi, would he then say that he has to revise his Benevacantism and say that Benedict is not the Pope, does not have the office of Pope because of Assisi of 86 or other things that he has said? Or Paul VI or um, John the Twenty Third. I, I would simply ask those questions to hear if there's some consistency with Dr. Maza here. But uh, moving forward, um, I heard something about Eusebius here. Now, as far as whether Eusebius wrote the what's called the Contestatio, um, which is the first document that 
uh, price deals with in here. Um, whether or not Eusebius wrote it is, is well, the document that he's referring to again is called the Contestatio, and this is the document that was put around Constantinople warning about uh, Nestorius and saying that he's like Paul of Samosata. Um, later accounts, later accounts in history attributed it, it, attributed it to, um, to Eusebius. We don't know for sure if that's the case. He also said Eusebius, who wrote this document, evidently was the same one who called out Nestorius as a heretic. I'd like to see some hard evidence for that. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I just have not seen that. Um, I've heard that before. I just, again, I, I would like to see the actual connection because I, I wonder if that's maybe speculation. It could be concrete. There could be concrete evidence. I just haven't seen it. That's a minor point. Another minor point was the claim by the author of the document that um, Nestorius is channeling Paul of Samosata. I kind of have to smile when I read the document when I, when I read <laughs> when he says that because it, it to me it reads like somebody today on the internet on facebook who's anathematizing bishop so and so and comparing bishop so and so to Arius and putting their words side by side and it's like okay well i might not agree with bishop so and so bishop so and so might even be a heretic but i don't think he's channeling Arius. <laughs> um so yeah, Nestorius was certainly heterodox in some cases. Somebody might say, well, his later on, later writings show otherwise. We, we can have that discussion another time. But there were definitely concerns with um, Nestorius even, even prior to those later clarifications. Um, so, n however, Nestorius channeling Paul of Samosata, again, I just kind of find it funny because um, – Obviously, Nestorius is, is not going to agree with Paul of Samosata and denying the divinity of Christ. Now, you might say, well, some of his views lead to that, but that's not what the author of the document is saying. The author of the document is literally just saying that he's he's affirming the thesis of Paul of Samosata, which is not the case, which is funny because in the past, what they do is they would always interpret uh, somebody who's a heterodox figure in in the context of a previous heresy. Um. And, and that's not always fair or accurate. Some Orthodox do that to us today. They'll call us Nestorians, which is, it's, it's funny to be honest, because it's so ridiculously absurd, but they'll say that our, you know, in the Roman rite, our devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus is Nestorian. And it's just kind of, it's so silly because it, Nestorianism was something very different. And, um, our, our view does not lead to Nestorianism, but it's that same mentality of, again, interpreting everything in older, older terms. Whatever, that's just a minor point. But I did figure I'd mention it here just because I find it fascinating that even back in the day, we have Facebook anathemas uh, <laughs> before Facebook, <laughs> before social media. Here, here's how uh, the average person engaged when it comes to theological discussions. I find it fascinating sociologically. Moving forward. Um, Pope Celestine on the loss of ecclesiastical rank. Um, it seems that uh, Dr. Mazur is, is under the impression that Pope Celestine believed that Nestorius lost his office automatically as soon as he began preaching. Um, that is not what um, Pope Celestine actually says. There have been people who have interpreted him that way, namely set of a contest. And it's usually because those set of a contest did not have access to the primary sources. They were reading secondary sources. Uh, but I'm going to actually read the primary source to you. So let's go through Celestine and what he actually says, because he does not say that Nestorius lost office. This is in his letter that is written to the people of Constantinople, which is after his letter that he wrote directly to Nestorius. So the letter is called Letter of Celestine to the Presbyters, Deacons, Clergy, and Laity of Constantinople. Um and this is uh, found in Celestine's Epistle 14, um, and it's on page 145, produced in English on 145 in Price's Documents and Proceedings on Ephesus. Here's what Celestine actually says. So let's deal with this historically. Quote, lest, however, the sentence by the one who has already called down upon himself a divine sentence may appear to be valid even for a time, the authority of R.C. has publicly decreed that no one, 
whether a bishop or cleric or a Christian of any profession who has been deprived of either rank or communion by Nestorius or those like him from the time when they began to preach these things is to be considered either deprived or excommunicated. But all these persons both were and remain even now in our communion because no one can be deprived or ejected by one who in preaching these things was himself stumbling. You'll notice nowhere here did he say he lost office. Never said that. What he does say is there is a divine sentence upon him from the time that he began preaching these things. What is that divine sentence? Dr. Maza is going to interpret this, along with the set of Acontis, is going to interpret this divine sentence as mean that he lost office, as we saw in the video. That is not what he's saying here. He is saying that he does not, number one, have the authority to excommunicate, that is Nestorius, he doesn't have the authority to depose or excommunicate clergy under him, not because he lost office, but because he himself was stumbling in the faith. They're not exactly the same, although I can see how some people would, would think they're related. However, when it speaks of a divine sentence here, what is it? Is it the loss of, of office? I could see how somebody could read it the way Dr. Maza is reading it. I mean, a divine sentence could be that one has been removed from office by God. That could be it. There's also other divine sentences, such as God condemns that person. So a divine sentence doesn't necessarily have to be loss of office. But we have to consider contextually and historically, since we're discussing this on historical grounds, what did Celestine mean? Did he think that Nestorius had lost office? How do we properly understand what was written here? Well, <clears throat> you will note that he does say something about people that Nestorius has deprived of ecclesiastical rank or communion, either rank or communion. Obviously, Celestine thinks whenever Nestorius is trying to um, make someone no longer hold ecclesiastical rank, that he is kicking them out of office. So in, in Celestine's mind, to say that uh, somebody has been deprived of rank or ecclesiastical rank seems to mean office because he speaks of them losing office when he says either rank or communion and that's what historically happened they were they were people that were being deprived of their office by Nestorius so for Celestine he he seems to equate a loss of ecclesiastical rank with a loss of office you'll notice he never says here that Nestorius lost ecclesiastical rank he just says that he can't judge somebody to depose them from their office because he himself was already stumbling and God has judged him which could also mean just a divine condemnation, but not necessarily loss of office. How do we know this? Again, let's look at the context. First of all, there are many instances where Celestine, in this very letter, sure seems to be under the impression that Nestorius um, held office even after the time of um him beginning to preach these things. He, he seems to still think that he held office just by the things that he says to them about their bishop, their bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius. So in the very internal evidence, the actual letter we're looking at, he doesn't seem to be under the impression that he lost ecclesiastical office from the moment that he began to preach heresy. Also in his preceding letter where he speaks directly to Nestorius, he doesn't seem to be under that impression either. Moreover, St. Cyril of Alexandria did not sure seem to be under the impression that he had automatically lost office. He often speaks to him and refers to him in his correspondences with the Nestorius after he began to preach heresy in a way that still thinks he holds office. And he even writes to Celestine trying to find out what needs to be done. He doesn't assume that Nestorius has already lost office. He consults the Holy See about him. Moreover, Ephesus itself, which Dr. Maza mentions, says something very curious. Watch this. The Holy Council assembled at Ephesus by the grace of God according to the decree of our most pious and Christ-loving emperors to Nestorius the new Judas. Page 229, by the way, of Christ. They're calling him the new Judas. They're writing him a letter letting him know that he is being deposed from ministry. But watch what they say. 
Be informed that because of your impious preaching and violation of the canons, you have been deposed by holy, the Holy Council in accordance with the laws of the church on the 22nd of the present month of June, and that you are stripped of every ecclesiastical rank. That sounds familiar to what we just heard whenever Celestine was speaking about Nestorius removing people from office whenever he refers to removing them from their rank. In other words, it sounds like what the council is saying is they're removing him from office, not just ecclesiastical dignities, that too, but also they're removing him from office. And they're removing him from office not from the time necessarily that he began preaching these things, but from the time he did not show up for the council and is now violating canon law because he's been asked three times to come to the council and he hasn't come. So they're stripping him of his ecclesiastical rank which I argue is stripping him of his office, not just of the title and dignity. Because again, prior to that, they weren't just treating him as if he had the title and dignity. Um, uh, they weren't just treating him as if um, he has lost office, but it has just retained the title and dignity. So that's how I understand Celestine. I don't think Celestine is saying that he has lost office but that God has judged him, and that would be a divine condemnation. But it would not be one that he has automatically lost office. And again, if you say, well, why is it that he was unable to depose people under him? Well, is it because he lost office? No, it's because he was found stumbling. And again, it seems that Celestine understands this concept of a loss of ecclesiastical rank with a loss of office, but he nowhere says that he lost rank. Moreover, um, <clears throat> let's just pretend for the moment that Celestine does think that Nestorius lost office. Let, let's just pretend that for a moment, that he lost office from the moment that he began preaching these things, and that's why he couldn't depose people. Um, and that's the divine condemnation he's referring to. It wouldn't make sense of the context of, of Celestine and his writings um, in the in this very document and in others, but let's just again go with that unnatural interpretation. Um, my question here is, how does that account for further development canonically that we has that says we are not allowed to use that claim today as historical precedent? So even if this were true, then canonically we don't have that ability today to make such determinations. And of course, I'm referring to Constantinople IV, and I'm talking about our Constantinople, not the Orthodox Constantinople IV, our fourth Constantinople, 869 to 870, namely Canon 10, uh, which says this, as divine scripture clearly proclaims, do not find fault before you investigate and understand first and then find fault. And does our law judge a person without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Consequently, this holy and universal synod justly and fittingly declares and lays down, here it is, that no layperson, Dr. Maz is a layperson, I'm a layperson, I imagine most of us are laypersons unless there's a bishop watching, uh, or a monk maybe, no layperson or monk or cleric should separate him himself from communion with his own patriarch, is the Pope a patriarch? Yes, he is. With his own patriarch before a careful inquiry and judgment in synod. Even if he alleges that he knows of some crime perpetrated by his patriarch. And he must not refuse to include his patriarch's name during the divine mysteries or offices. He can't use remove his name from the offices if he's a cleric. In the same way, we command that bishops and priests who are in distant dioceses and regions should have similarly should behave similarly towards their own metropolitans. So this applies even to non-patriarchs, to also just metropolitans, basically our own bishops and archbishops. And metropolitans should do the same with regards to their own patriarch. So even bishops are under this actual canon. If anyone shall be found defying this holy synod, he is to be debarred from all priestly functions and status if he is a bishop or cleric. If a monk or layperson, he must be excluded from all communion and meeting of the church until he is converted by repentance and reconciled. And so my question then is, has the Code of Canon Law of 1983 overturned this? If so, where? 
And would this canon not at least morally be binding? I'm not necessarily trying to appeal to some juridical binding here, although one might be able to argue for that, but I'm more apply, appealing to a moral, moral principle that it's giving us here of not judging our patriarch to the extent that we are now removing ourselves from their communion, that is, we're judging their office, until they have been judged synodally. And it would be also curious how that works with Pope. Now, it does actually talk about judging the Pope synodally later on in a, in a later canon. Uh, which I think was, what, canon 21, was it? Um, I forget which canon. I know I've dealt with it in a previous episode. Oh, well, we'll, we'll come back to that another time. It's not, not absolutely pertinent to hear, but it does, again, note that we are not to judge our patriarch or our bishop insofar as we're determining their office without them having been judged by the proper authorities. So I, as a layman, can't just say, you know what, Nestorius, you lost office. Not according to this. And I would again ask, what in the 83 code overturns this moral uh, imperative? Because they're applying, they're appealing to scripture and moral principles from scripture for this. So I'm not even trying to argue juridically for this. I'm just arguing canonically for the morality behind it. Upon what basis do I have that? I don't think that I've seen anything enough from Celestine to say that. Celestine doesn't mention a loss of office. Um, and again, he understands Nestorius removing people from rank to be a loss of office for those lower clergy. And then the council of Ephesus thinks that it stripped Nestorius of his office, seemingly. I'd like to hear some alternatives for how Ephesus understood that if it thought that it just stripped him of the clothes that he wears in a liturgy or something or the title, but not the actual office. Again, what was the point of the Council of Ephesus otherwise. Well, he says to formally declare it. Okay, why do we need it formally declared? If I can already privately judge that he's not in office. Moreover, I want to appeal to something else here that we saw from Celestine, which I think is the death nail for this thesis. And so, again, we're going to go to, let's see here, page... Uh, what page were we on? <laughs> Let me find it. Yeah. Is it page one? F oh, no. No, no. I lost it. Because I lost my bookmarking. <laughs> I'll find it. Because here, there's something really important that Celestine has, says here. Uh, letter to Celestine to the Presbyters, Deacons, Clergy, and Lady of Constantinople. It's towards the end. Let me get it. Yeah, here it is. Here's the death nail, I think, for the Maza thesis here. Even if Celestine thinks that he lost office, that is, Nestorius lost office from the moment that he began preaching heresy, which I don't think, again, makes sense, but let's just take that unnatural interpretation. Watch what he says again. Lest, however, the sentence by the one, that is God, who already called down upon himself a divine sentence, let's pretend that means that uh, God has removed Nestorius from office, may appear to be valid even for time. The authority of R.C. has publicly decreed. What is he saying here? May appear to be valid. That's interesting. He is telling us Prior to the judgment of the Holy Father, or a council by extension, that is any aspect of the universal magisterium, but prior, prior to the judgment of the Holy Father, we can't say validly that he lost office, which is exactly why he's writing to the people to tell them, hey, I'm confirming this is the case, that God has issued sentence upon him. Why even write this to the people of Constantinople telling them he needs to reassure them about the validity of this if it's already something I can do privately? 
Can you imagine the mess we would be in if I can just privately start judging which bishop I'm going to be in communion with and which pope I'm going to be in communion? Can you imagine the chaos that would ensue in the church if it's really left to us laity to determine who is a bishop and who is not, who has office, who doesn't? Can you imagine? I mean, a, a ton of Catholics overnight <laughs> would, would separate from their own bishop. If, if they can make that determination, which is exactly why Constantinople IV was writing against this idea, because there were people who were doing that. But can you imagine the chaos that would ensue if every time I thought Pope Francis or any pope engaged in heresy, or if any time I thought a bishop taught heresy, that I can remove myself from his communion, I would be a set of a contest. Who would you be in communion with? And are my standards really what determines whether or not somebody has lost office? My standards of orthodoxy, my private judgment? This is back to the relativism of private interpretation of Scripture over against the magisterium. If, if your interpretation of Scripture boils down to your private interpretation in spite of the magisterium, it boils down to every man for themselves. And you'll have as many opinions as there are people. And you're right back to the era of Protestantism. If I get to judge my bishops like this and I get to judge the Pope and who holds office like this, we're done. We're back to Protestantism. And this is what some set of a contest do. And that's why they end up being set of a contest because they're doing exactly this. And they say, you know what? I saw uh, John Paul II do some wacky stuff. I saw Paul VI do some weird stuff. I saw John the Twenty Third say and do some weird stuff. I saw my bishop do some weird stuff. I guess I can just, you know, remove myself from their communion. Here's what's at stake. If they're wrong, that's schism. They're creating a schism. So, in other words, if Dr. Maza in this thesis that we're hearing, if they're wrong, that would be inciting people to schism. Uh, somebody who would maintain this thesis. Because... They're going to take that and they're going to say, okay, well, my bishop said something that sounds heretical, so I'm going to remove myself from his communion because I don't believe that he holds office anymore because he's automatically lost office because of this precedent that I see with Nestorius. Isn't that, again, um, going to lead people to schism? Somebody's asking me, what's the name of the book again? Council of Ephesus 431, translated by Father Price, Documents and Proceedings. Um, is Michael saying that Nestorius lost office only after Ephesus 431 said so? Can you show me that he's lost office prior to that? How can we then make sense of Celestine? And if he's already lost office and that's self-evident to the laity, why is Celestine writing to the people of Constantinople telling him that it's necessary for him to issue a judgment on Nestorius to confirm the divine judgment? whatever that judgment may be. Why is it necessary for him to do that? Now, Celestine does also give him time, 10 days from the receipt of receiving it, uh, before he's excommunicated from the universal church, which means the Pope thinks that he has authority to excommunicate people from the universal church, not just from communion with the Church of Rome, which means he thinks that uh, he's the head of the church, which obviously the legates at Ephesus proclaimed. In other words, that actually, that doesn't make sense for Eastern Orthodoxy, how the Pope could think that he could excommunicate someone from the universal church. It would make sense from their perspective that he could excommunicate them from his own church, Rome, but not from the universal church. But Celestine clearly says that. Um, at the same time, however, right around this time, the emperor called a council. So, um, they had to table the 10 days of the Pope and the Pope, um, uh, his, his 10 days and, you know, excommunication um, effectively was suspended until uh, Nestorius had an opportunity to be examined at 431, which the legates at, you know, Ephesus agreed to this. So this wasn't contrary to the will of the Pope. Um the problem is Nestorius doesn't show up, and so he's he's um, he's deposed because of that. But my question is, deposed from what? Deposed from using the title bishop? The, the, 
deposed from just using certain vestments? Is that what he's being deposed from? Or is he actually being deposed from office? Sure seems like he's being deposed from office. And how does that make sense in light of the Maza th instead of a contest thesis? Well, it doesn't, to my knowledge. Maybe we can hear more. Uh, maybe there's a way to reconcile it. I don't see it, but I also wonder how does that also then work with uh, Constantinople four, And then how does this practically work? How does this not lead me to this set of contism? Because I've seen some disturbing things from popes. Does that mean I get to say that they lost office? Uh, Lord Yamsha, thank you for the soup chat. Why isn't the church perfect? Um, the church in its human element is, is certainly not perfect, but um, the church in its element, um, its divine element, if you will, that is united to Christ, uh, we can speak of some perfection there. Uh, not to fully separate them, because that perfect church also exists in concrete individuals. This is something the manualists engage in further detail, so maybe maybe consult them. Um, that is, how, how can the church be holy and when its members aren't? You know, those, That's the question that a lot of manualists dealt with. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Cyril wrote to, I'm sorry, Celestine wrote to Cyril May 7th, 431, still hoping for the conversion of Nestorius and allowing him time to repent well after the 10-day deadline. Right, I mean, the, the Ephesus wasn't something contrary to, to his will. Um, and again, it doesn't make sense of Celestine in the context of the letter, prior to the letter, all of it. It, it doesn't seem that he's under the impression that he lost the office in the way that he speaks to the people of Constantinople or the way that Celestine spoke to Nestorius himself. Now, he thinks that Nestorius is a heretic. He thinks that he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He calls him those things. But I don't get the impression that he thinks he lost office. In fact, I get the impression that he thinks that he's a wolf in sheep's clothing in office. That's, that's the impression you get when you read Cel Celestine to Nestorius. Um, he seems to be indicting him as a bishop who is in office, who's a wolf in sheep's clothing, not somebody who has lost office. So I, I, I think we have to interpret those words of Celestine that nowhere say he lost office. That's, again, speculation. Um, I think we have to interpret that in light of the context historically. So I would, I would love to hear more from Dr. Maza historically as a historian. Uh, where I am mistaken in my understanding of Ephesus, Celestine, Cyril. Again, did Cyril have the impression that after the moment he began preaching these things that he lost office? Cyril is not under that impression. Was Cyril wrong? Uh, I'd like to hear. Um, let's see. <laughs> Consult say manual of the manuals. That's funny. That's really funny. Okay. Well, I think that's going to do it. I'm trying to see. Uh, yeah, Pope Pius XI, who, who did write an encyclical dealing with this. Pray St. Cyril for not separating from Nestorius by his own private judgment, but instead for waiting until the church had been judged by the church. Yeah. Right, um, until he had been judged by the church, I should say. Yeah, I mean, Pius XII, oh, I'm sorry, 11th talks about this. You also have, um, I don't agree with everything that they say, but I think that it's still substantially consistent with what I'm saying. Cisco and Salza in their book, um, was it true or false, Pope, deal with this case because, again, it's raised by set of a contest. So in their book, Refuting Set of Contism, they engage this. I don't take exactly the position that they take, um, but... Overall, I, I I would say you know I'm in agreement with what they're saying, and the the areas that I'm in disagreement with them is trivial. It doesn't change the conclusion of what I'm saying. Um, so maybe check that out if you also want more more information on this, um, which is what I put in the chat. You know, on on uh, Gordon's video, I just put in the chat that I think you know Cisco and Salzo have already put this set of a contest argument to rest. Uh, so people might want to check that out. Uh, okay, so I really appreciate y'all and your support and watching. Please share this on your social media. Um, make sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Check me out at patreon.com forward slash reason to theology for extra content and to support my channel so I can continue to bring these out for you. 
And um, also one last thing, if you want to check out my magisterium course where I go over teaching authority in the Catholic Church, go to uh, MaximusInstitute.com. I offer a whole course on understanding the magisterium that is incredibly relevant to a lot of these discussions. It will certainly equip you to deal with the vast majority of the cases that we're hearing from others. Because I will say a good 90% of the errors that we hear online are due to a deficient understanding of uh, Catholic teaching authority in the magisterium. You would be shocked how many scholars do not understand the magisterium. Um, it's very sad to see that, by the way. But I'm hoping to help in some small way offset that by bringing more of an awareness on how the magisterium works to everyone on social media here with YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and all that good stuff. So anyways, check it out if you want, MaximusInstitute.com. Again, it, it supports me, so I'd appreciate it if, um, if you're willing to do that. Um, and yeah, somebody said that Cisco and Salza also shared their issue on Nestorius on their website if you don't want to get the uh, get the book. So I, I have seen it online as well. So you should be able to just do a Google search for it. Um, but I think that what I've also expressed here substantially encapsulates what they're saying. Um, although, again, my thesis is slightly different than theirs, and, and I'm appealing directly to the primary sources, whereas Cisco and Salza, to my rec recollection, are relying on secondary sources. Um, you have the benefit of this video of going more to a primary source, primary translations, rather than secondary and tertiary sources. So there you go. Hope you all enjoyed it. All right. See you all later. God bless. Oh, wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.